Siri will see you now. How's everybody feeling? That's what we want to know um, that our chatbots are going to ask. We want to know this illustrious panel and I have been uh, talking back and forth in an email thread about what's most important, what's biggest on our minds, what's the, the thing that, uh, that, that we want to see in, in chatbots, in artificial intelligence that speaks to us in a medical uh, situation. I'm going to do a brief introduction and go through uh, some of the questions on our mind and then open it up to the panel. My name is Brian Ogden. I have 10 years of clinical practice in um, counseling and uh, two years in hospital work and then another 25 years in digital development. Uh, Gigi is the CEO of Ebo AI and um, really one of the leaders here that I've seen in Malta bringing forward business uh, business case and being very successful in in his business dealing. So I, I, I greatly admire everybody on this panel. Um, Maxine is a health coach and an entrepreneur. We have um, represented from from both AI side and the consumer side. And um, Daniela is uh, the chief operations officer for the Richmond Foundation, which does mental health, uh, community mental health support and is an NGO. Dan, um, or excuse me, Nate, um, you run B, you, you're the, the chief, say it big for me. Chief revenue officer. Chief revenue officer for, um, uh, for Boom AI, which is um, one of the best use cases for chatbots, and you do voice uh, bots over the phone, right, for your call centers because they save a great deal of money doing that, right? Right. right. So how can we best serve our patients with the chatbot technology that we currently have? What can we do now? We, we've heard from other uh, experts in AI at the, at the state of the art in diagnosis um, and, and some of the inner workings of AI, but this is, this is for chatbots that talk to you. These are for, for text bots and for, for voice bots. And you know, what kind of security can we expect? Can we expect them that they'll, they'll know how we're feeling? Um, how easy are they? And I'm going to open it up um, uh, to all of you to go ahead. What's burning on your heart? JJ, close yours. Shall I? Thank yes. you. Um, well, thank you for that kind introduction, Brian. Thank you for having us here today. Um, it was good to hear most of the discussion centering around clinical AI, but I'd like to also bring focus to basic concepts like patient engagement. When you patient side of the clinical activity, you realize that typical, typically healthcare providers fail on the most basic task, and that is being openly available to communicate with patients 24-7. Our focus has been radically transforming that particular interface. So I do believe that virtual agents play a very important part in augmenting human capability, in automating that touch point that a healthcare provider needs to have with the patient. And that does reduce anxiety, and it does assist in the workflows that we typically observe. Uh, GG's deployed, how many offices do you have now? We're in nine countries, but our, our largest operation is with the NHS in the UK, where we serve some of the largest trusts in exactly this area. So I hope to share some stories throughout the session today. <laughs> So, Maxine, when you, when you stepped up for this, your concern was on the same line. How far ahead um, do you think we are in terms of actually serving people? Um, my, my initial concern is that we don't know enough. The general public I'm talking about. So I, I'm referring to the patient, to the client, to the consumer. And with that lack of knowledge brings fear. And when we have fear, we lose trust. And when we don't have trust, we don't build relationships. Outcomes fail miserably. So we have all this effort, all this data, 
what we do with the data is crucial, and it's recognized for me that artificial intelligence has a valuable place in medicine. Of course it does. But it's known where it belongs primarily to the people who can access it and process it easily and then can use it to optimize outcomes. At the moment, I think if you ask most people, they are so fearful of even the word AI. And when I say people again, remember we're talking about the patient here. So we all have to educate ourselves, and if we're in the caring profession, the first thing we need to do is care. And what I try to do in my line of work, I was always taught to seek to understand first, and then seek to be understood. Nate, when you are approaching voice for um, serving clients, and you've got to be considering medicine at this point, um, what, what brings reassurance to somebody else on the other end of the phone? I think the thing that AI is going to do the best um, is not have these really elaborate, meaningful conversations. Like when Maxine's in front of somebody, she's going to do a great job of understanding them clearly and care about what they have to say. AI is not going to do that. What AI is going to be able to do is help somebody get in front of a care provider as soon as possible. So the distress that a lot of people have is how do I get in front of that care provider? So what we're, we're doing right now with AI and with our we have 1,600 call center agents as part of our organization. So we have quite a few. And 70% of those call center agents are using a soundboard technology that we developed early on to be able to communicate with people so that if somebody's an offshore agent and they're talking to somebody from another country, they can use a pre-recorded statement using uh, the accent of the native country. So it's very common for us from the Philippines to call into the United States. Um, and we'll use a native United States sounding accent to talk to people with a Filipino listening. So we've been developing this over 12 years and it sounds very, very natural. Most of the time people have no clue that they're talking to somebody from the Philippines because it sounds like our, my CEO, COO is out here too. It's his sister <laughs> in a lot of these recordings. They're talking to Brad's sister and they don't, they don't know that it's actually somebody in the Philippines. Well, what's good about this is uh, AI needs a good data lake, right, to be able to determine what it's going to say and how it's going to behave. Well, we have that because every time somebody in the Philippines is listening to conversation talking about Medicare, and the United States Medicare is, um, you know, the, the kind of the senior insurance programs that we have. When we're talking about Medicare, we have an agent listening, pushing a button, and we have dispositions afterwards to determine whether or not, whether or not that call was successful. So we can now have the AI go back through and listen to all those calls and say, this had a positive outcome, right? Or this had a negative outcome. Let me, let me see what this person was saying based off of these key bu keys that are being pressed and determining how that conversation is going to go. So I guess that's a very complicated way of saying we, we know a lot of what's happening already. Now we can create an AI that's going to not do anything elaborate for sure, but it's going to be able to take a call immediately and say, how can I get this person in front of somebody who needs to talk to them as fast Danielle, as possible? Danielle, is that, is that reassuring to you, that explanation about how his um, automated call center works for people? No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I work with, with, a, with a, um, many people who would not be able to even have access to what, he, what you're talking about. So my worry with, with technology in general and AI is that we're, we're creating a two-tier system which is accessible to people who can use a simple user interface and people who cannot use that simple way of, 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 um, uh, of, of accessing healthcare. Um, especially, I mean, we work with um, people who call us or chat with us um, experiencing um, distress mentally. So it's purely mental health support. Um, uh, and it, it worries me that on the other end of the line, there is, there won't be, there is no, the, actually the fact that you know that on the other end of the line there is a chatbot um, will actually not make you want to actually access the actual chatbot, chatbot function as well. So these are things that, that, that go on in my mind when I, when I hear these. these. Gigi, how would you fix this gap? Right, I think the way that we need to qualify what is a successful call 
is not whether the AI model is capable of understanding whether the call went well or disengaged at the right time, but it is, has it created better clinical outcomes? If we're in public health, that's the only thing that interests us, right? So uh, I can build on what Nate said in this way. If an AI tool can create better conversations, which as a result allow the patient to be more invested in his and her care plan, and as a result that does create clinical outcomes, then you've got a nice linear correlation between the technology and the outcomes which are, you are creating. But I'll give an example which is directly opposite to that which Daniela recounted. So one of the largest eye-opening experiences for us in the UK market was uh, in the sexually transmitted disease segment whereby we use AI to reduce the discomfort that young patients, typically aged 14 or 15, are the very first signs of uh, sexual activity feel when they meet a clinician who is 55 years old and very often of a different gender. So what we found is that using a virtual agent which has some degree of emotional awareness can allow the patient to be more open and honest about the sexual activity which led to the potential disease. And we've actually found a correlation between that, better diagnostic capabilities, and actually reduction of the state's budget towards then uh, later care because of undiagnosed activities. So I believe, Daniela, the way to address your concern, which is entirely justified, is for us clinicians, public health experts, and technologists to understand where AI can be beneficial. And certainly, that is not everywhere. So I'm going to back up completely. Um, the research that I've done completely supports what you've just said. So I'm not against AI. Quite the opposite. We know that sometimes when we have problems, speaking to somebody who's not involved in those problems, speaking to somebody removed, actually puts us in a better place to receive the feedback. So we know there's a place for AI, and I'm not suggesting at all it's an all or nothing. What I'm proposing is that we really need to be careful that we are not excluding people, and that AI is in addition to, not instead of. And as long as we keep choice, and choice is about personalization, and we are moving towards personalization of medicine, now, going back to what you said earlier, and we're here to have a debate, <laughs> not to fall out, right? Sure. But um, this morning in the opening speech, Chris Fern quite rightly said that we need transparency. With transparency, we get trust. I want to know who I'm speaking to on the end of a phone. I don't want to be misled by somebody or, or be thinking it's somebody else. So the minute the trust is not there, the brain, and I'm no neuroscience, but we hit barriers immediately. So there is a place for AI, but the end user, the customer, the patient, needs people who have excellent people skills. And that, as we just heard, is very complex, very ad hoc. And we need to utilize every sense as practitioners to take the data, to take the information, and inform the patient the client in a trusted environment that allows them to contribute to their well-being and play a part. This um, contextualization is a new move in medicine. Uh, recent studies are supporting each of these, these panelists. Um, Danielle, I wanted to say that there's been peer-reviewed work in the same area Gigi's been in that's actually convinced skeptics after they talk to a bot that they can be empathetic and available on a, on a more human kind of level. Let's, let's move the conversation a little bit away from interface and empathy. Let's go to security. Let's talk about security in, in conversational assistance. Yeah, they're looking at me. Yeah, Nate, well, uh, I mean, you're uh, over the I'll, phone. It's, tell us about right. security. So two, two thoughts to kind of, I know we're moving on a little bit on the last one. I will just say I, I second all the opinion that there's only there's only so much the AI right now should be doing, and um, and I think doing things like taking doing intake and scheduling, especially when you're dealing with um, people who are under duress typically uh, that are clinicians, is where it sits right now, which makes sense at least for us. I mean that's what we're doing, so that makes sense to us, right? And I think that goes into the security aspect of things when you're dealing with AI. Um, and you're dealing with information that's coming through the AI, in some ways it's going to be even more secure because you're not dealing with a human being. 
Um, we have private servers where this information sits that are secure and um, you can't really hack into them or whatever it may be. We had an Amazon gentleman up here before. You can use their servers too up in the cloud and they're gonna be just as secure. Um, so that information is just as secure, or more secure there than somebody who's gonna be taking a phone call in between seeing patients who might be under duress themselves and writing something down on a piece of paper that can be seen by just about anybody. So in many ways, your information that's gonna be going into these private servers is gonna be much more secure than it would be in a traditional cl clinician's hands or their staff's hands. Gigi? Perhaps I'll build on that, Nate. Um, beyond the, the discussion we should typically have about technical security, so cryptography and so on, I think one of the areas which is of interest to us because it does touch on security in a clinical environment is this concept that AI helps to foster accountability. So we typically have more clear registers of activity which show us the chain of custody of different pieces of data, of conversations, of interactions. And this is where I think we all can tie it into Daniela's point earlier about sustainability and equity. So if the models which we use to train our AI are correctly trained and are as devoid of bias as possible, one other aspect of security is ensuring that when we execute these models, we have less human error. And that's a very important process in diagnostic medicine because that's exactly what you want to reduce. You want to reduce bias, which comes out of familiarity, exhaustion, time at work, and so on and so forth. So security to me has these two levels, the technology, technological level, which we want to ensure is in place, infrastructurally too, but more importantly, clinical security. And perhaps I'll add a point about sustainability. It's good that we talk about this you know, two-stream world, a developed world and a less developed world. We need to ensure that the AI models that we develop are not simply made available to less developed parts of the world, but are sustainably fixable in those parts of the world. So it's not simply an act of charity which brings them over from the States or Europe to Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's actually creating the skills to make sure that they are perpetually observed, that they are kept accountable, that we're promoting human safety, and that the concept of transparency, which apparently the minister spoke about this morning, is maintained even in the less developed nations. That is the true sense of 360 security beyond technology per se. Daniela, what do you want to see? What do you want to see? You're, you're the custodian, really, of, of public care, of, of people who have been, um, you know, troubled, and, and they're approaching a service. We're, we're, we're all, I, I think the three of us especially are entrepreneurs in, in AI. We want to get our service out there. And here's these troubled, troubled people. How, do they, how are they going to be protected from us? <laughs> I have no idea. You know that answer. What I want to see, though, is that the most vulnerable person and the person who is the most vulnerable technologically is safe and has access to that technology as much as you and I have it. So if we're going to, actually the word is when we're going to get to that stage, the, the technology has to be accessible and has to be um, um, easy for somebody with a disability, with an intellectual disability, for example. And so the way that the AI would, would communicate with somebody with an intellectual disability they would have the same results as somebody, the same outcome as somebody who does not have the type of disability. That's where I would like things to be. One so day. accessibility is important. Here we are, we're, we're talking about, you know, one of the things that we all face as we're looking for a venture is this idea of scalability. You know, how can we, how can we bring these things to a, a large mass of people? And you're saying, well, there's an individual, there's individuals in this, in this that aren't going to fit in your mass. And we're concerned that those people will also be served. Nate, you want to say something about that? It, it's a really good question. As far as accessibility goes, I think it'll be accessible to really anybody. If you, if you put a phone number on a website and you call that phone number to get a hold of a clinician of some kind, well, that phone number, anybody has access to it. And so that's when the AI, at least in our world, is going to start interacting with somebody. I think with Gigi, it's the same way. You call in, you're going to talk to some of his AI, and, or if you call in on ours, you can talk to the same AI, and the outcome should really be the same. We try to drive for the simplest conversation possible, always. 
Um, we try to go to yes, no questions. We don't try to do open-ended things um, so that the outcome can be as predictable as possible. When we engage with, uh, for us, we work a lot with dentists in the United States. It's, it's pretty simple. We want them to be able to get in front of the dentist chair, and they want to be in the front of the dentist chair. So the outcome goal is the same on both sides of the call. So we just ask as many questions as we can, excuse me, as clearly as possible to be able to get that done. Um, so that, I don't know if that addresses all of it, because there is some individuals that are going to have needs that may not be met with this. Um, and that, you know, plays to the whole human element that's always going to be involved, at least for the next little while. Gigi, can you say something about specialization in these cases? I will. Um, well, let me start off by saying that accessibility is not only about lack of access to technology, Brian, but it's also about psychological barriers. So I think the point which um, Maxine was making earlier is fear keeps people back from accessing technology, not because they don't have the devices to do so, but because there's a specific barrier which limits them. And I think the solution to that is quite clearly articulated. I think we need to move away from the aggrandized hype that presently exists in our market. I think it is a disservice when companies or nations over-promote the benefits that AI can realistically bring in the market. And large companies, I mean, IBM Watson's experiment in oncology backfired really badly, you know, when they had a claim uh, that, you know, the 12 cancers they focused on could be better diagnosed in 85% of the times than, uh, than other traditional humans. And they were wrong on that. And I think it broke a lot of the confidence that the industry had, and it created this fear. So I think we need to be transparent about the benefits and the risks that technology have. And we need to ensure that patients, especially when AI becomes very complex, can understand how it supports their care, allowing humans to always have the agency to override technology decisions. So we should widen discussion about accessibility from tablets and smartphones and 5G and so on to something which is more, more, more innate, and that is the irrational psychological fear or distance of using technology. That's the real barrier. And uh, You know, bucking up completely what Jay just said there, I think ultimately we all have a role to play because we must move forward, we must progress. And AI, um, we have choices, you know? So I don't know about you, but I get an email or I get a message saying, how would you like us to communicate with you? Would you like a text? Would you like an email? Would you like a call? For me, this is about knowing your client and knowing their preferred methods. And nothing changes here. Some of the great practitioners take the time to get to know the patient and how they work. Now, if we are backed with data and information, we will be trusted to share, disseminate, inform that data. But there needs to be a link. There needs to be a human person who gets the trust because the whole system is too large for the general patient at this stage to understand. So once we are convinced as practitioners, making an appointment, let's be honest, is not the most emotional aspect, and I totally agree. Why would you not want to just go online and not be bothered? It's like when WhatsApp first came out. But people are emotional, and because we have emotions, we need to understand and interpret those emotions, and that's not always easy with yes, no questions. So we have to probe, but that is almost a different medical field. So now we're talking about the person at the end of the chain who is interacting with the customer or the patient. And then let's use these wonderful AI progressions to support us. But it cannot be all or nothing. It must be in addition to, and what we are providing must be a better service that creates better outcomes. And I think ultimately that's what we all are in the business of doing. Um, Gigi had mentioned a, a, a faux pas of a large um, uh, multinational corporation that overstepped. Um, you, I can see why you might be concerned, um, Daniela and, um, and, and Maxine. 
Uh, additionally, we're a room full of clinicians here, many, many of us, are, are very concerned about patient care. <laughs> All of us have served in, in healthcare and we're, we're in this for, well, to help people. And, and we would hope that, that our uh, dissemination and our work of AI would be um, maybe first stop uh, for, for Nate, who, who's very good at, at, um, at yielding, uh, you know, bringing in the net, talking to anybody. And then the next step might be Gigi's uh, bot after that. He might route to a more specialized situation, and, and then um, to, to move on, a human being might intervene. So in, in each of those things, we're talking about patient care being central uh, on the issues of security and empathy and, and accessibility. I, I would agree with all that, and our goal is never to try and replace you guys. <laughs> There's no way. We're not that smart. We just know that we can talk to somebody and get them on your books, right? That's all we're trying to do. Gigi's smarter. He's trying to do stuff that's more advanced. That's cool. And, and we're all going to do things, but we're never going to replace anybody like, you know, Danielle or Maxine. They're specialized in doing what they're going to do. And AI to replace them would take, you know, I don't know, 50 years is my guess. People would disagree with me, but I've seen it in practice. I actually know where, it, where it's at because of if its implementation. So, our goal is to augment that, and our goal is to eliminate the parts of your job that you don't want to do that distracts from actually caring for that person, helping that person. There's a number of things that you have to do every day that are probably terrible and you don't want to have to do them. Well, let's let AI do that stuff so that you don't have to. You can then focus on that human being, on that moment where you can help them. And, and this, we've been, I've been listening to the talks, these conversations here for a while, and one thing I noticed on Brian's website, I checked out your website, of course, and everybody else's and Gigi's and everybody's. Um, and one thing that was on there is this has been a very, very heavy kind of conversation from the beginning. And what you have on your side is sometimes let's have fun with it too. And you can, we have fun with AI, believe it or not, in our conversations with people. And sometimes we actually do, to Maxine's point, say at the beginning of the call with the AI, hey, this is an AI tool. So people are aware of what's happening. and and then we can kind of feel like we, we're free and we can kind of joke with a person a little bit with the AI and it kind of blows their minds afterwards. We say, this is AI, and then they interact and it's like, this doesn't sound like it, you know? So I, I think that's- Bot or not, keep in mind. bot or not. And you're saying, well, we declare. And yeah. I, I think that's an important ethical point that you're making about, am I speaking with uh, an agent? Yeah. Am I speaking with a human? Right. I, you know, I, language is very complicated. And in many ways, language divides instead of unites. So I can see there's a benefit for very clear, very precise, almost technical yes, no, and data, and let's remove the emotion. But on the flip side of that, when you ask a question in prep to a client or a patient in clinic, to get a straightforward answer is not particularly easy. And this is sometimes, we've all had a chatbot that's told us, sorry, can you say that again? Sorry. I don't understand what you're asking, et cetera, et cetera. I read a research document that actually states that frustrates people when a chatbot says it to you more than when a human being says to another human being, sorry, I didn't understand you. Because when we say it to each other, we have eye contact, we have body language, we can move our head. But when you hear, sorry, can you repeat yourself three times, you've disengaged the user. So it's small little subtle hints of communication that sometimes get lost. But I think what we're hearing is there's a place for it. But maybe what we should also consider is that the great practitioners we have, the great people who are informing and holding hands and caring the end user, maybe we should be creating more of these alongside our AI specialist as well. So more people with people skills, and let's blend all our wonderful talents together. Gigi, you know, I know this for a fact, we only have a minute left, but I know this for a fact that you have a really multidisciplinary team. Do you want to say a little bit about how you've put into practice those things that Maxine was just discussing? Yeah, right. I think that patient engagement will increasingly be about a blended service. I think Maxine put it quite rightly. So I think that one of the key fundamental practices that we put in place earlier on is to understand when AI hasn't understood the context, when it is unable to understand the intent 
and sentiment of that conversation and when it therefore needs to escalate to a human agent. When you understand that particular interface point, that creates the exact blend of human and AI skills. That's why I think that AI is not here to replace human agency and it needs to augment it in the best way possible. And of course, as Nate said, it all starts off with the right personalization of the AI tool. So part of our team actually works on giving a character to the AI virtual agent, but ensures that the identification of it being an AI tool is the fundamental starting point. Also because- Thank you, thank you, Gigi, I appreciate it. We, we are now on negative time. We, well, we can go we're, negative. It's all right. Everybody else did too. Oh. I, I'll just have one last thought with it too. Uh, and they mentioned this in the in the previous panel. I'm sorry, Brian. I'm hijacking the whole. It's conference. all no, no. I, I, they're not going to come after me. No, they'll come after me. They won't let me come back. Um, it was a long flight anyway. But um, we have to start somewhere, right? And AI takes training. Gigi's AI is more complex than ours. His takes even more training. And if you don't let us start, we've got to start somewhere, right? And if we start at basic levels, it'll only get better over time. And that's what we've got to be able to do. And, and there's going to be some give and take on the perfect scenario that we're trying to create with the AI versus what actually happens in the outcome. But you have to train AI, right? That's the machine learning part of it. And without time and experience and failures and little things in the front, you're, we're never going to get there. So anyway. Thank you, uh, esteemed panelists. We appreciate your... Your input today, I think this is a pretty solid group here. How about a round of applause for this panel? Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for having us. Thank you, us. Dylan.